Hello, students. Welcome to the first lecture in our Nemeth code series. Uh, this is all about the Braille code that is truly built for math. As we go through these lectures, I want to be clear that my goal is to give you the large understanding of how the Nemeth code works, how it all fits together, and an overview that you can hang the details on so you have some structure in your thinking. Because of that, it's important to remind you to read your textbook closely and carefully for the details. Make sure that you are doing those practice activities that are built in to your reference materials, um, as well as work through the homework. Be sure to uh, get in touch with me if you have any questions about this content as you are working through your own practice. The Nemeth Code was designed by Dr. Abraham Nemeth to give him a way to write higher math formulas. He was really a genius before his time, uh, and Nemeth works a lot like computer programming because of that, even though it predates computers by a bit. In UEB, including in UEB Technical, symbols always mean the same thing. That means that basic shapes in Braille are chosen to have their common literary meaning. And almost all math then is relegated to kind of lesser importance, meaning that the math symbols are generally more complex. Simple signs like plus sign are two cells long in UEB because in all writing taken together, plus signs aren't really that common. But inside math, signs of operation are common. Since Nemeth code is just for math and science, a plus sign is very high frequency within the math and science context. So in Nemeth, those high important signs of operation are given a high frequency braille cell, a single braille cell. For example, the plus sign is dots 346. It's more space efficient in that way. When writing math, um, and it wastes space when then what you're writing is sort of text or literary things. The Nemeth code really logically respects the structure of a math equation which can make it easier for congenitally blind children to learn math concepts. The flip side is it may also make it harder for sighted teachers to learn the Nemeth code on the front end. So where are we at currently as a country in terms of using the Nemeth code? The Braille Authority of North America adopted UEB, including UEB Math and Technical, but it also continues to support the use of Nemeth code for math and science notation. This ended up dividing our country. There are now two codes available for Brailing math. The official statement is to use what the student needs, but the Braille Authority of North America did not give any guidance on how to determine which code a child needs. That's led to some states deciding that they will now be UEB technical only, and they don't teach the Nemeth code in those states. College entrance exams, however, have remained largely Nemeth only. So for the most part, college bound students have continued to need Nemeth. But if they're in a UEB state, they may also need UEB for their 10th grade standardized testing, requiring students to be fluent in both codes essentially. Widely, professionals do need to know both codes because some materials may come in one format while others come in another. And this is not actually that huge a problem because knowing how to recognize multiple writing systems as meaning the same thing is something we all do every day anyway. There are two different approaches to tackling learning the Nemeth code for math and science. The original textbook uh, from the 1980s, that's a college textbook for Nemeth is now pretty outdated largely because the examples are all given in the eBay context rather than the UEB context, but also because the way that print math has been written since then has updated a little bit. That book teaches the Nemeth code in the order of sort of symbol families, much like the Aroga chart did for UEB, where things are grouped together. Another approach to tackling the Nemeth code is to learn it by grade level so that you work through the complexity of math problems in the same order that a child would as they grow up and learn increasingly more math. Once you're done with this crash course in Nemeth and you get out on the job, 
you will most likely spend a whole year on each grade level of math with each student, giving you lots more time and repetition with each level of complexity, so to speak. But your first NEMA student might be in high school, so you might be starting at a high level of complexity and then building on forward from there. Uh, this class offers both of those structures to try and help you understand math from simple to complex and also understand how the contractions or symbols hang together in families that share common rules. Because Nemeth is now written in UEB contexts rather than in eBay contexts, there's some provisional guidance out on how to use Nemeth inside UEB. This deals with the problem of how do we know that something is a plus sign and not an ing contraction. But it's actually really simple now. Though it does waste a lot of space in the beginning, at least with early math stuff, the approach is that we now turn on Nemeth mode and turn it off again when we're done with it. We start with the Nemeth indicator to start Nemeth, and then we end with a terminator when we're done. The Nemeth indicator is always in a passage mode. It stays Nemeth until you formally terminate it. But you already know how to do this because you've done capital passages, italics passages, bold passages. Now we just sort of have a math passage. To open Nemeth with the Nemeth indicator, you'll use a 456 prefix and then a 146, which is like an SH contraction in UEB. Fun history, in the old computer code, we would, or in computer programming, you might mark something off with a percent sign. And um, in the now defunct computer code, the 146, that kind of SH shape, was the percent sign shape. So there's sort of some relation there, which I think is clever. The 456SH sign gives us the cue to start reading everything from this point forward in the Nemeth code. So we read and write everything in Nemeth for a while, we do whatever math work we're going to do, we work with the equation, the student solves the equation, and then at some point we're done with math, we're ready to go back to regular writing, so we use a Nemeth terminator, dot 456156. So again, it's a two cell contraction with a 456 prefix, and then it's that WH shape to be done with the math. These can also be placed on the line above and below math when needed. We usually do that with like spatial math or maybe algebra equations that are going to take most of a line and be worked for several lines. When that happens, the start Nemeth indicator can be placed in line with the directions that are before the problem, right? So you have some instructions about solving a problem, might say solve for X, and then you would start Nemeth and give the equation that has X in it to solve for, and then at the end, terminate it. The terminator can be on a line of its own, or it can be in the same line at the end of a function or equation. As a Braille reader, this code switching is very easy to understand. Like I said, it works just like all sorts of other passage modes that we're familiar with. On the transcriber side, it's a little more difficult because you have to decide when is the right moment to start it, when does the math get really mathy enough to require Nemeth, and when's the right place to end it. We're going to build on that little by little. We'll start simple with easy elementary worksheets, and we'll build it up over time. As we start learning some things, um, we might write things in Nemeth that don't really need to be in Nemeth. Numbers that are standing alone can usually be in UEB. If there's not a sign of operation acting on them or they're not written with something like a square or a square root, then generally you can just leave them in UEB, especially if they're next to other text. However, sometimes we also do those things in Nemeth just for the sake of teaching Nemeth. If kindergartners are learning to write their numbers one, seven, nine, four. We might have the student write those numbers in Nemeth so that they learn in kindergarten how to write math numbers and are ready to build on it later. You'll do some of that in this class as well. Pay attention to the instructions on individual assignments and remember to ask if you have any questions about how you should be handling something in a given homework. Remember, at the end of the math equations, 
math sections or sciencey bits to turn Nemeth back off so we can go back to using UEB for other print text. Remember to turn off that passage mode with the 456 prefix and then dots 156, the WH shape. That way, our Nemeth always sits inside those sorts of bookends, and it's very clear whether we're reading the Nemeth meaning of a shape or the UEB meaning of a shape. No confusion. So on to those numbers. How do we write numerals, digits, or numbers when we are in the Nemeth code? Nemeth numbers still start with a numeric indicator, dots 1, 4, 5, 6, and then the numerals have their own shape, a little bit different from UEB. They're similar, but they're dropped to the lower half of the cell. We use the numeric indicator anytime we're following a space. Because our numeric mode is only terminated by a space or some kind of punctuation indicator, we can continue to write digits after the initial numeric indicator all the way until the end of the series. So the numeric indicator works a little more like a word mode than a letter mode like it would in UEB. It lasts a little bit longer. The shapes are lower cells in Nemeth so that we don't always have to use the numeric indicator. It's math after all. Numbers are going to come up all the time. Make sure you use the numeric indicator after a space to set the numeric mode through the end of that sequence, but then it doesn't need to be repeated after a plus sign or a minus sign. You can just keep going with that side of the equation until you get to a space, and since the numbers are lower cells, it will be very clear that they are a number. To start off looking at our numerals alone, you see the line here, number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then 10 as an example. So the numeric indicator appears after each space and all of the digits in those numbers follow them. We also have some multi-digit numbers here. For example, 100, 234, 6,000, 840, with the zero at the end, and then 3.5. To get to bigger values, uh, you might notice we use a comma. The mathematical comma in Nemeth is a dot six. So that means that the dot six, when it's following a numeric indicator, means a comma in math. The dot four six means a period, um, specifically a decimal point. That four six in the middle of a number or the four six following a numeric indicator will always be a decimal point. In math, our parentheses are the of and with cell shapes. So dots one, two, three, five, six, and two, three, four, five, six. And those don't need punctuation indicators because they are math punctuation. So they just follow in numeric mode. Sometimes they can even set numeric mode for the parentheses, which is pretty cool. Other punctuation, like sentence level punctuation adjacent to a math problem, or maybe something like a colon inside of time, does require a punctuation indicator. And that punctuation indicator in the Nemeth code is the 456 prefix. So we'd use the 456 prefix in front of a period that ended a sentence if the sentence had an equation right before the period. So we were in that Nemeth mode already. If there was a question mark or an exclamation mark or something that was part of the sentence, part of the literary meaning, as opposed to a math meaning like, what's your answer? Um, when they do kind of that, four plus three equals question mark, that has a different symbol or an exclamation mark meaning factorial. We'll get to that much later in the class. The other choice other than a punctuation indicator in those moments is to just terminate Nemeth before the sentence punctuation. And again, we'll get to that sort of more complex way of transcribing it later in the year. Spacing is really important for Nemeth equations. Signs of operation, plus, minus, times, divide, never have spaces around them. 
Even if there's a space in the print next to the plus sign, do not put a space next to plus signs in Braille. Signs of comparison do have spaces around them. Even if the print did not have a space, we always put spaces around equal signs, greater than and less than signs, ratios and proportions. Signs that compare one half of the equation to the other half of the equation. They always get a space around them. And that's really important in Nemeth to make it possible for a tactile reader to efficiently find the balance point of the equation. Vertical spatial math problems, those ones that are aligned by place value from top to bottom, do not require any numeric indicators in Braille. This makes it really easy for times worksheets or adding worksheets for young children to be efficient on their space. In those spatial problems, we place the operation, the plus or the minus, one cell to the left of the leftmost digit in any row. The equals line at the bottom uh, is a bunch of dot two fives in Nemeth. Notice that's different than UEB technical. Uh, and it must be one cell wider on each side of the problem. So we draw our equals line a little bit wider than the problem itself. There are no guide dots used in Nemeth. Uh, when you're doing a vertical alignment, it is one of the times where spatial alignment is the only alignment. So our operations, those plus, minus, times, and divide, let's get into them. Nemeth operations are sometimes strong group signs of one or two cells in length, except for the minus sign, which is a lower group sign. Our plus sign is dots 346, looks just like a UEB ing. Our minus sign is dots 36, note that's the very bottom of the cell to do a minus sign. Our times, there's a lot of ways to write times in print actually. Um, and because of that, there are multiple ways to write it in Nemeth as well. Times like the multiplication cross, that little X in a math problem, usually what kids learn first in school, is dot four prefix and then a one six. The more simple times dot that algebra often writes where they just put a dot in the middle of the equation is just dot one six. The more simple print is a more simple Nemeth. There's also a times that's like an asterisk that one is 1616. So there is a Nemeth way to write each of those kinds of multiplication. They also have related meanings in math and they have related shapes in the Braille, which helps the Braille reader understand them. I wanna go off on a little tangent here and tell you what I have personally done with my students over the years to deal with that there are multiple ways to write times. I, as the teacher, as the transcriber, tell my students I'm responsible to always write the time sign that appears in the print. So if your math worksheet that your teacher gave you has a print multiplication cross, that little X, the dot 416, then I as the transcriber have to give you dot 416. When students hit middle school and they learn that multiplication dot, just the dot 16 alone, whenever that's first introduced, my students generally say, well, that's dumb. Why would I ever use a two cell contraction if I could just use one cell? Brilliant child. You got it. Absolutely true. So here's the thing. You as my Braille reading student, when you are writing math, when you are solving math, you can use whatever version of the symbol you want as long as it has the same math meaning, right? So if you're doing a worksheet and the worksheet is using all multiplication crosses and you're having to solve multiple lines of that algebra equation and you just want to put the dot as you're doing your scratch work, totally fine, always write. I tell my students if they write a multiplication symbol, doesn't matter which one they choose to write. If it should be multiplication, they wrote multiplication, they get it right. I keep transcribing it however the worksheet shows because I need my students to be able to read all of the symbols because I don't know which one they're gonna see on their state standardized test, their ACT, their SAT, or their GRE. So I need them to be prepared to read all of them. For that reason, it's on me to represent whatever the print represents. But that doesn't mean that they have to do it in their own writing. They can absolutely pick their favorite. Conversely, if a student says, I've been doing dot four, one six for five years already, I see that 1, 6 is a thing, but it's more automatic for me to keep writing times the way I've written it the last five years. That is also perfectly acceptable. 
in literacy, we need a way to read and we need a way to write. And our students should have the autonomy to choose what style they want to write in. If the meaning is the same, the work is still right. Okay, so division symbol, the division symbol that's kind of a horizontal line with a dot above it and below it is dots 4634 in Braille. So again, it's a 46 prefix and then kind of that ST contraction. More accurately, it's a 46 prefix and then the fraction line. And that makes sense because a fraction line means divide the top by the bottom. Again, related math concept, related Braille symbol. Long division follows kind of the long division in print. Whenever a long division sign in print is written with kind of that curl at the beginning and the line over the top, the Braille equivalent, the curl at the beginning is like the letter O, but it's happening in numeric mode. When we write the problem as a transcriber, we just put the O. So we put the, the small number and then the O and then the number that it's going to go into, as kids like to say. Um, and then when they're solving it is when they add the spatial line at the top. So there's kind of a different way to transcribe it when it's just the problem versus when they're actively working the problem. And that's really all about Nemeth Mathematics saving space. Once you get into adding and subtracting, there are also situations where we use signed numbers. That means a number that is either labeled as a negative or even distinctly labeled as a positive. See that a lot in chemistry when you have like plus two electrons or something. Um, I guess it would be plus two protons. Let's say that right. If you have a negative number in Nemeth, the order of cells, this is really important, is the negative indicator, then the numeric indicator, then the number. So I have here negative three, negative numeric indicator two, so this is a, a negative two, a negative one, and then just for example, a zero, which would not ever have a sign. Um, other signs of operation, like the plus sign, actually start numeric modes themselves. So with a plus sign, the sign numbers in the positive direction, plus one, plus two, plus three, the equivalent of this print up here, plus one, plus two, plus three, don't require numeric indicators because the plus sign in math always starts numeric mode. Something must have a numeric meaning if you can add it to something else. So once you're adding, there you go. You don't need numeric indicator after. So pay close attention to those two. Now that we have our signs of operation, we need to be able to actually solve that equation. We need a sign of comparison. These serve as the fulcrum of the scale, the balance point for the two sides of equation. If 4x is equal to 8, it tells us the balance is level. If 4x is greater than 8, it tells us that we have one side greater than the other. If 4x is less than 8, it tells us that the scale is balanced the other way. So these are our signs of comparison. When the two signs are equal, we mark them in Braille with a two-celled sign of comparison. The two cells are dot 4, 6, then 1, 3. So this is not the letter x. This is two different cells. It's 4, 6 on your right hand and then 1, 3 on your left hand. Then uh, if we have a less than sign, the leading sign of that equation would only be one dot. So we'd start on our right hand with just a dot five, and then on our left hand with the dots one, three. Of course, if you grew up in a culture that says the alligator eats the big number, here we put the little dot on the little number side and the big open mouth dot on the open mouth side. For our greater than sign, the leading sign is gonna be larger. So we'll put our dot four six, our bigger dots toward the bigger number. And then on the second side of the equation using our left hand, remember we're gonna go right left for all of these signs of operation. Um, the second side would be just the dot two, the smaller number of dots by the smaller number. Super intuitive for kids who are blind to learn greater than and less than symbols and not get them confused. Because these are signs of comparison, they're really four cells long because there has to be a space before it and there has to be a space after it. So really you're doing space, right hand, left hand, space. Meaning is directly related to the design of the braille. So if that alligator is eating the big number or the big number of dots goes by the big number, you have it straight away.
This is one of those really nice places where sort of the froofy language used in classrooms to help students understand concepts and keep track of things actually works for the Braille reader too, which is kind of a rare treat for the blind student sitting in a gen ed classroom. Ratios and proportions are also two cells for their signs of comparison. Remember that it's not going to use a colon, even though the ratio, it, ratio or proportion might look like it has colons. Um, it follows the meaning of the math, which is that this is a sign of comparison. So again, it's going to go right hand, left hand for each sign of comparison, um, the proportion and the ratio being either one dots or two dots. And those are both lower cell. So we're talking either dot five dot two or dot five six dot two three for our two celled signs of comparison. And remember, always put those spaces on both sides so that a braille reader can quickly find the middle of their balance to understand the two sides of the equations. When we're solving equations in math, we often change things about one side and do a matching change on the other side. And so having a clear reference to where that midpoint is, which might be way over to the left or way over to the right, is really important. Now that we have our numbers, our signs of operation, and our signs of comparison, let's talk about some special symbols used for units of currency and other related units. Dot four is a really common prefix here. For lots of our currency, we're going to start with a dot four. Dot four S will be our dollar sign. Dot four C will be our cent sign. Dot four L will be the pound sign. Dot four E for euro. Dot four Y for yen. Super logical. Of course, there are symbols for other things too. Even money that doesn't exist anymore has brailled signs so that you can write those same things. These are written unspaced from the numeral. Keep them right next to the numeral they apply to. If it comes first, it will even set numeric mode for you. So if you're writing $4, you can just put the dollar sign 4 decimal 00, zero um, if you're in Nemeth mode, which saves you some space. Of course, if it comes after the money, uh, then you would need to have the numeric indicator first. Remember that Braille readers perceive Braille linear linearly. It's not like print where you can see the number and the cent sign all at the same moment. They happen in order. So start with a numeric indicator if you're using something like cents that comes at the end. If you need to mark a blank space for an answer. There are two ways to do that in Nemeth. If the answer is left as either just open space or a question mark um, or like a box type answer where it's, you know, 4a plus 2 equals box, then we do a full cell in Nemeth. If an underline is given to write the answer on, we do four blank cells of 3, 6, like four underscore cells. And that's regardless of the length of the line. It doesn't vary by line length. To write times in Braille, like the time of day that it's 8.30 in the morning, um, this is pretty space inefficient in Braille. But that makes sense. How often do times come up in a math problem, realistically? Not all that common because they're a different kind of number. They're a different base. We operate on them differently. Um, but when time is taught in math class, if that's where it's being introduced in early elementary, then I do have my students write it in Nemeth, largely because it's a great way to introduce the punctuation indicator and that the punctuation indicator terminates our numeric mode. Um, students are generally still young enough at that point to be practicing writing their numerals, so it makes sense to have them practice in math class writing these in Nemeth. So to write a time, it would be numeric indicator, the hours, punctuation indicator, dot two five for the colon, numeric indicator, and then the number of minutes. Also related to our special symbols are things like the percent sign and their cousin, the mill. These um, are written based on the one out of 100 at using the Nemeth zero as that indicator of percent. So the dot four prefix again, with the Nemeth zero or that dropped J shape will give you the percent sign. Or if it's the per mil, which is like a zero over two little zeros, also related to percents, um, that in Nemeth is dot four and then drop zero zero again. So very related concepts. 
Another common unit would be maybe inches or feet that are done with kind of those tick marks. Um, we use the same symbol in Nemeth as we do for a prime uh, indicator, like in derivatives. And that tick mark, that single apostrophe or that double apostrophe is just a dot three in Nemeth. So if it's one single apostrophe, you're just going to do dot three. If it's two of them, like for inches, then you're going to do dot three, dot three. It just follows along really logically. If you've got the desk reference Nemeth at a glance, um, I think it's a really great desk reference to have when you get out in the field. Great book. You can use it to follow along in this class. Uh, you might choose to use it later in your profession because it goes by grade level. It's so easy to look up the level your student is at and really kind of focus in on that level. The first half of the book has a lot of teaching strategies as well as some history and perspectives on Nemeth. You can read that part like a novel. It's some interesting stuff to know about, to think about how you will teach students well. In the very middle of the book, you'll find a chart of all of the Nemeth symbols that are commonly used, arranged by grade level. Um, and sometimes I give students extra credit or participation projects if, they, if they're needing an alternate for something um, out of that section. That only applies if you've talked to me about it and made a plan for that. Then the next section of that book is grade level examples of common problem types. This shows those symbols in realistic context that you would see them with students learning that grade level of math which again, very functional when you're doing a worksheet to go look up, show me how other people have done these sort of long division problems. What was the layout? What was the spacing? It's a nice clear example. And then at the back is an assessment tool that you can use to track how your students are doing with their Nemeth symbols and find, you know, if you get a new fifth grader on your caseload to assess and see, do they know all their symbols up through the fifth grade level? Or did they miss like a category of symbols in third grade? Maybe their curriculum went in a different order and they switched schools and they, they like missed a chunk. You can find that out to fill in gaps and help students be prepared and successful for their next level of math. This is also a good introductory point to remind you that abacus is commonly used to serve as scratch paper for blind children learning math. It can be inefficient to write out the steps of solving problems on a Perkins Braille writer sometimes. So we often have students use their abacus as scratch paper to work out the intermediary steps before recording their answer on their Braille writer. Uh, so if you're following along and learning the abacus this semester as well, make sure that you either, that you have your abacus in hand when you're following video tutorials or reading your textbook on them Make sure you're actively setting the numbers, doing the actions, walking through it on the abacus yourself. It really helps with comprehension and retention. Lots of TVIs have made YouTube clips about abacus skills. Just make sure the ones you're following are using a Cranmer abacus. You can tell it's a Cranmer when it's got a five bead on it. Um, Cranmers also have felt on the back so the beads don't move for kiddos who are blind. But any tutorial that shows you an abacus with four beads on the bottom and one five bead on the top, will work exactly the same way and you can follow those examples. There are a lot of right ways to solve a math problem on an abacus. It's just scratch paper. It doesn't do the, any calculation for you, so that's fine. Um, as long as you're consistently doing the same steps and getting the right answer, that's okay. There's a lot of ways to add and I don't care which one you use. When you're teaching abacus, make sure you first are teaching one-to-one -one counting of objects up to 20. That means that the child can move an object and say the next number and be consistently saying one number per object. We want to get past the point where little toddlers will move, go one, two, three, four, five, six, and they're counting and they're moving are not in sync. One to one counting means that we go one, two, three, four, and that they always match up. We also need students to know that the final number they say is the number of items there are. That's kind of a developmental math thing usually occurs around age three. Um, also helpful for abacus to teach skip counting by fives. Students should be able to say five, 10, 15, 20. That's very helpful. Um, as well as the ability to count on. 
count on starting with any number means that we can start at seven and then keep counting. So I can start at seven and go seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I can start at three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That ability to start at another number other than one, very helpful in solving basic arithmetic. From there, we teach setting the numbers on abacus, adding and subtracting, and then teach whatever skills would be on pace with their peers. The abacus is just for scratch work. If the class is solving addition by counting on, solving addition with partial sums, solving addition starting in the ones column and moving up, starting in the solving addition starting in the highest column, moving down and regrouping, all of those can be done on abacus. You can teach whatever strategy the general class is teaching and have the students stay right on pace. Uh, feel free to look at my other videos to see some live examples of those. Thanks and happy brailing!